the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I'm very glad to be with you again here. And especially to see again my friend Hamlet. I would like to uh, share with you today a few thoughts from uh, a gospel text from the Gospel of Mark. Verses 26 to 34. 26 to 34. I will not read the text in English. It will be read to you in Armenian, and then I will share with you a few thoughts from this text. Yes, I got it bought. Vorohede <laughs> This is the word of Christ. May he be a may he be a blessing for you. The theme of my um, short message today is the gospel as story. I guess we all like stories. Children especially. But also grown-ups. I am traveling a lot in my job. And in the last two months, I have been home only for a week. During one of my last trips, one of my grandchildren um, made a great surprise to me. He wrote a little story of a drop of water. Uh, who had many adventures. Uh, and uh, uh, his father printed it in a little volume. Uh, and uh, he dedicated the first copy to me. If you are a grandparent, you know how important that is. If you look at the Bible, it is full of stories. We can say, God, the grandfather, tells stories to us, his children. The gospel is full of stories. But in the last two, three hundred years, something happened to the gospel. Theologians have transformed the gospel from story to philosophy. Instead of telling us what Jesus did and his disciples did, they transformed the gospel into a sort of argument. Instead of inviting people into God's story, they try to, to win arguments. The gospel became dry and boring. Kind of a specialty for people who have a special kind of education. 
հատուկ մարդկանցամոր որքեր հատուկ կրթություն ունեն but this is not the gospel of jesus christ բայց է հիսուս քրիստոսի ավետարանը չէ the gospel of jesus christ can be understood by children ասա խոսք կարող է հասկանալի լինել երեխաների համար and people with little education and եւ մարդկանց համար քիչ կրթություն so i would like to tell you a few things from this text about the gospel and story ուզում եմ դրա համար այս տեքստից ձեզ մի քանի բառ ասել ինչպես աստծո խոսքը որպես պատմություն stories use metaphors պատմությունները օգտագործում են մետաֆորա metaphors are 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 a figure of speech խափությունները որոնք sorry they are not a figure of speech a literary means to communicate բառախաղ են անում պատմության հետ they are basically comparisons դրանք հիմնականում համեմատություններ են Let me give you an example. Orina. If, if we say a boat is like like a, a little object that floats on the ocean. Orina knava ka vorpes pokhri kar arka vor logom e ofkenos sibrayo. For instance, the uh, nutshell that that floats. Da da depi ap apuch. We compare we compare a boat with a nutshell. Make hamatu mek navaka hoch api het. But metaphors are like comparisons where you have only one of the elements. Pats metaforanere hatuk panel vor unek arakanerets elementnets men meka. Jesus says, As Jesus asume, I am the door. Yes am door. How do you interpret a metaphor? Ichpes ek haskanups. How do you understand I am the door. Do you think that he is like that rectangular object that has a handle and hinges? Of course not. That would make no sense. What Jesus says is, I play the same role as a door plays. I separate two spaces. Ես բաժանում եմ երկու տարածություններ and I'm like the door and you can get through me to another space. Ես նման եմ դռանը եւ դու կարող եք իմ միջով գնալ դեպի մյուս տարածությունը։ In this text we have a metaphor. Այս տեքստի մեջ մենք ունենք մետաֆորա։ It is a metaphor of sea. Սա սերմի մետաֆորա։ Now how do you think about the Christian life? Ինչպես ենք մտածում քրիստոնեական կյանքի մասը։ What kind of metaphors do you use? What kind of images do you use to understand the gospel? Some people, especially in the United States, prefer very violent metaphors. They talk about Christian life as a fight. As cultural war. ինչպես մշակույթների պատերազմ and they want to win the cultural war եւ ուզում են հաղթել այդ մշակույթների պատերազմ it's it's like you know my god is going to beat your god իմ աստվածը կարող է լինել քո աստված you find a lot of that in the old testament maybe նա ավել դուք դա գտնեք ձեր վկայությունը but if you look in the gospel բայց եթե թե խոսքին ենք նայ the gospel and jesus especially prefers a different kind of metaphor ալ հիսուսը խոսքում ուրիշ տեսակ է փոխաբերություններ է օգտակար He prefers peaceful metaphors. Na khavagutsyan hamar khavagutsyan pokhaber tsunerokta. Much more subtle metaphors. Yeah, a, a, a more a, a more refined. Avali bari He talks about light. Luisi masne khosu. You see light doesn't shout at you. Luisi chigorum zerbera. If it's dark and you light a candle, there is light. Yete muta uduk varum ek luisi da lusavorum. It doesn't aggress you. He talks about seeds. He talks about yeast, the thing with which you make bread. They are not aggressive metaphors. They are metaphors about the 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 fine way in which the gospel works in the hearts of people. So here are from our text three things about the gospel as metaphor, the gospel as a seed. Aha, yerek tesak te kho 
pentru că vorbesc se. The first thing we learn from this metaphor is that the gospel is a mystery. Mystery, something, uh, something that is hidden. You know, a, a farmer would put the seed in, in the ground. And then water the seed. And then would go to sleep. He doesn't have to watch the seed. He doesn't have to unearth the seed from time to time to see if it grows. That would destroy the whole thing. He does his part. And then God makes the seed grow. Because the seed has the life in it. That is happening with the gospel too. We preach the gospel in places like this one and then uh, we try to encourage that seed to grow in a person's heart. But we cannot make it grow. No much how hard we try. We cannot make it grow. It is a mystery. It is a a, a, a strange thing that happens in the heart of people because God works there. So this is the first thing about the gospel as a seed. It is a mysterious act of God. The second, the second thing about the gospel as seed is that it involves cooperation. Synergy. <coughs> you know, there is a version of theology that says that God does everything and humans just have to accept it. It is called Calvinism. It started from the theology of Jean Calvin, a French theologian, but it became kind of a a dogma, uh, kind of an ideology, one century after he died. Calvinists pray, uh, preach uh, and teach that God decided for some people to go to heaven and other people to go to hell. And it doesn't matter what you do, if God decided so, you go to hell or heaven. I'm sorry, but I cannot believe in this kind of God. This kind of God is a despot. This kind of God is a dictator. He's a dictator. I don't believe in this kind of God. Yes, I this is not the, Bible, the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is a God of love. The God of the Bible made us in His image, which is already a great risk. Because as God is free, we are made to be free. And you see, he did this because he is a God of love. God, love requires freedom. This year, we celebrate 40 years of our marriage. If 40 years ago I told my wife, you have to love me, do you think it would have worked? No way. And God doesn't do that either. He is trying to entice us, to bring us in with His kindness, with the flowers He has created. 
And he's teaching us to attract a partner <coughs> through our kindness. And because God is love, <coughs> and he is creating us as free human beings, which is, as I said, a great risk, because my wife could have said no when I told her, I asked her if she wants to marry me. God did the same. He invited us to love him, but we could have said no. And unfortunately, the first humans he has created have said no to God's love. That is what the Bible calls sin. So in spite of this risk, God took another greater risk. He has decided to make us co-laborers. He invited us to work together with him to administer the world he has created. That, that's what I mean by the gospel is cooperation or synergy. That is what I mean when I say that gospel is cooperation. We do something and God does something. It's not humans without God and it's not God without humans. The gospel is always cooperation. And so I told you that the gospel is a mystery, is something hidden. And the gospel is cooperation. We do our part and then go to rest. And then God does his part. And then the miracle of life happens. But there is a third point here. That the gospel is paradox. This is why philosophy doesn't work with the gospel. You know, philosophy works with logic, with linear logic. You know, in arithmetic and in logic, one plus one plus one makes three, isn't it? In God's logic, one plus one plus one makes one. How can this be? It's paradoxical. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. It is something hidden. We cannot explain it. We only believe it. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one, two, three, are one. So, in the same paradoxical way in which God is, the same is true about the gospel. We find that in the parable of the sower, which is in the last part of this text. Um, the sower plants a mustard seed in the ground. I don't know if you have mustard plants here. I don't, we don't have them in Romania. But we know from botanics two things at least about mustard seeds. Besides the fact that they are very small. One thing is that mustard seeds are medicinal. They are used to bring healing. The second thing is that they are like a pest. They are like a weed. It's like a bad herb. If you plant 
a mustard seed in your garden, it's taken over the garden. It spreads very quickly. It's hard to control it. <coughs> but this is true about the gospel too. The gospel is a tiny thing. It is nothing in human secular terms. But it is meant to bring healing to humans and to society. <laughs> and it cannot be controlled. Because it has in itself an amazing power. But our text also tells us that when the mustard grows, it becomes like a big tree in which birds take uh, make nests. Now, if you live in the city, you think that birds are those nice things that fly from tree to tree and sing nicely. But if you are a farmer, an agricultural worker, you know that birds are not good news. <laughs> they eat the fruit, they eat the seeds, they destroy your harvest. What does the Bible tell us about the gospel? Is that it also grows in the context of conflict. It is not that there is God and everything is perfect in the world, but there is also opposition, there is a devil and his angels. And there is also a struggle between the life that is in the seed and those who want to destroy the life. What we know as Christians is that darkness will never win over light. There is opposition. We should not be naive. If somebody tells you, if you believe everything will be good with you, don't believe them, this is a lie. We Christians have accidents, have illnesses, we live in a broken world. And it would not be fair for God to protect us from all that is human. Yeah, I mean, if God treated us in a special way, it would be like buying our love. It would be unfair. So, gospel, the gospel grows in the context of conflict. The gospel, the seed of the gospel grows in the context of it is a paradoxical reality. It is bringing healing, but it can be eaten up. But we know the opposition will never win. The gospel is a story. And stories are not aggressive things. They try to attract us. The gospel invites us to join. The, jo the gospel, which is God's story, invites us to make it our story. For that to happen, however, Something tragic has to happen first. If you plant a seed in the ground, what has to happen first before the seed is turned into a plant? The seed has to die. 
Life can only come out of death. You can join the gospel story only if you are ready to die. I don't mean physically. Or that we will all die physically one day. You have to die to yourself. To your own ambitions. To your own pride. To your own interests. Because God's story is a story of love, is not a story of selfishness. So I'd like in this afternoon to invite you to join God's story. God doesn't promise that everything will be light and easy. But his promise is that he will always be with us. Even when we go through the deepest troubles. And at the end of this story, we will join the saints in the celebration and service of God. Are you ready to join the story of God? And are you ready to pay the price for this? It is a high price. It is a costly price. But it is worth it. It is worth it. And you will reap huge benefits if you do it. The decision is yours. May God's Spirit put his, the seed of the Gospel in your heart. And may it bring rich fruit for God's glory. Amen. Amen.